And the research we did um, asking kids why they were seeking help or why seeking help was a good thing to do, they really s said they were seeking help because the teacher knew what to do. You know, you know how to do math. You know how to solve these problems. They're not trying to get their ki the other kids in trouble. Uh, some of the highly aggressive kids were trying to get other kids in trouble, but very, very tiny group of people were reporting to get people into trouble. They see you as having the knowledge and skills to handle conflicts. You, we tend not to do the social development kind of stuff. We expect them to get, get it from the air, and most kids do. They get it from interacting with their peers. But some kids don't. And when they're coming to you to ask for help, it's like solving a math question, you know? How do I make this kid leave me alone? You know, what am I gonna do? My daughter was in grade one, and the kids were um, playing games at, the rec at recess, and it was the boys choking the girls game. Um, and they also were writing on their coats and things. So the girls were really upset, and um, the, they went to the playground teacher, the playground teacher says, I'll, you know, play around here, you know, I'll keep an eye on you. Well, they didn't like that too much, but then they went to their teacher, and their teacher said, well, you have to go and tell the boys' teacher. So they went to the boys' teacher, and nothing happened. Things didn't get shut down. So eventually, um, I, we decided, probably with a little help from me, decided she should write a letter to the principal. So she writes this letter to the principal saying, you know, um, these boys are doing such and such, and um, she took it to the principal, and the principal shut it down. And it needed, you know, all those people. It needed to tell your mother. She needed to tell her teacher. She needed to tell the person on the playground. She looked and looked and looked to try to get someone to help her, because she didn't know how to make the boys stop doing this. Um, and I think that's what we want to encourage. That's what we want to have happen here. And if you shut it down, um, this time, you're not going to have to keep doing it. So ultimately, you're going to have a slightly more peaceful classroom where people are not hurting each other is what you're going for here. You're training them on how to solve the conflict. You're bringing the people in conflict together to talk about what are solutions. How can we make this not happen anymore? I have a two-rule practice, uh, two-rule um, rule in my practice. If you have the same fight twice or more, you've got to change it. You know, like there's no point in having the same exact fight more than twice for marital couples, romantic relationships, kids and their mothers. You're not going to go anywhere by having that same exact fight. So let's try something else, you know. And you are there to help them to figure out something else. Um, you don't have to be perfect, you know. You're just offering suggestions. You're just offering alternatives and helping them to think of ways of doing things. So there's a bunch of activities in the classroom. You can have a special constable week or day. One kid becomes a special constable to kind of help other people use their wits. Um, you can have a poster contest or a poem contest. I'll circulate this little book. This is the poster contest um, from one year. And um, gives you some of their pictures that they did. Um, and um, this is the 2007 poster winner. Um, there's also this pamphlet for using your wits at home. And there, um, you know, really tells you the difference between healthy conflict and unhealthy conflict, how to um, use this to look at TV programs and talk about some of that relational victimization that goes on in TV. Um, I don't know how many people watch the idle things. <laughs> they, these reality shows, these reality TV shows, are just full of victimization, relational victimization, just packed with it. Um, and if you're a parent, um, pointing it out and talking about it and saying how, you know, this is entertainment, this isn't how we treat our friends, um, you know, how would you feel if someone said that to you? Um, some of the criticisms on American Idol, I mean, some of that stuff is just so petty and harsh. And um, somehow we think, you know, it's entertainment, and we're teaching our children to think it's entertainment, and then we, th we wonder, you know, where are they learning all these skills? Um, it's not just because their parents are aggressive. Um, so how to, how to have a wits time out. So instead of, you know, you have to sit in that chair for three, three minutes until you calm down, and then um, you can get up and go off and play, a wits time out is a little more like this. It's um, 
<sighs> okay, walk away, ignore, sit down. When you're calm, we're going to talk it out, and I'm going to help you. So it has a little different tone. You know, it has a, it's not quite so you're being punished. It's more like you're out of control, you need to regulate your emotions so we can talk about this and find a better solution. Okay, um, there have been several evaluations, and I'm not going to sort of spend a huge amount of time on this evaluation, but I just want to give you some sense of how much has gone into this program. Um, these, all of these things, if you want hundreds of copies of them, you can get them from Dorian Brown um, at the Rock Solid Foundation, and they have a lot of these things copied. Um, they can't supply the universe, obviously, at some point communities are going to have to get their own fundraising thing going, but um, we have been really, really fortunate in terms of getting gaming money and money from our sponsors to uh, make these materials here. Um, okay, so the evaluations. We've um, had several evaluations, one in, 2000, in 2003 and then a more recent one that involved school districts 61 and 62. Um, in the first evaluation, we started looking at children who were in first grade. We followed 400 children forward, um, actually, um, to look at the WITS program till the end of grade three, but we also followed them forward to grade five and six just to see what was going on. Um, the numbers that we were able to track across grade, uh, to the end of grade three, so we started looking at them at the beginning of grade one, grade two, the end of grade one, the end of grade two, and the end of grade three. Um, by the end of grade three, we started to lose the really high-risk kids. Um, so the data is affected by that a little bit. Um, in the first study, there were 11 program schools in the greater Victoria area, well-established schools. We were doing, we were evaluating proud programs, so programs that already had the WITS program in place and we're, we're doing it for a couple of years, some of them, some of them um, maybe only one previous year. But also six schools uh, in, the, in the Greater Victoria area who had not, who agreed not to adopt the program for two years, um, for the three years of the study. We um, had looked at the data in terms of um, the effects on low poverty schools, schools with less than 10 percent of the students. Uh, from families on income assistance and higher poverty schools. And the findings are a little stronger in the higher poverty schools. Um, but I'm not going to burden you with all of that detail. Um, we looked at both relational and physical victimization and changes in both. Um, the relational victimization, how, do, how often does a, another classmate tell lies about you to make the other kids not like you anymore? Um, surprisingly enough, first graders can answer these questions. <laughs> and we've looked at all kinds of measures of the um, reliability and validity of these, of these measures, the social experiences questionnaire. And you actually can do it with first graders in a modified form. Um, so first, and physical victimization, how often do you get pushed or shoved? Um, people pull your hair, that kind of stuff. Um, threaten to beat you up. Um, so this is the, the pattern we get pretty much for anything, for physical victimization or relational victimization in these data. Across the first um, three years, we see this pretty dramatic drop in the WITS schools, and um, the comparison schools stay fairly flat, um, or even start to go up a little bit um, by the end of, of third grade in both relational and, victim and physical victimization. Um, and most program evaluators die for these interactions to look like this. So we're very happy for the, for the program to be showing an effect. Um, are there effects after grade three? Um, after grade three, which was about here, um, in the continued data, these kids continued to drop they didn't go back up. These kids continued to rise. Again, um, the drop is probably more dramatic because we lost um, probably 50 percent of our sample, and this generally happens in longitudinal studies with little children. When they moved from grade three into grade four, we could still find them, but by five they're in a different school. So we're starting to interview them in their homes, and um, the most 
um, hard to follow families are the families who you most want to follow in these studies, the kids who have a lot of disruptive behavior. Um, a lot of moves um, also um, it, by this point. So finding half of the sample, I guess we, we were trying to be grateful.